sort of wispy chrysogorgia coral. We collected something similar earlier in the dive. There's okay, a come tiny on. crinoid on it. So the chef aboard Falcor at the time, he was saying that the lettuce, um, he can store for, you know, a couple weeks and then it just starts to dry out a little. Like, okay, in my fridge, that turns to slime. <laughs> like, oh, we just got like, he's got like a wall full of like silica packets. It's just like, yeah, just takes the moisture out of the air. Oh, That's amazing. Silica I need packs. silica packets ah, for my fridge. Yeah, they were like industrial size. I've tried to look for them, but you could probably just get like a bowl of the little ones. I don't know. Like but every time you, you buy like, <laughs> collect them out collect of them <laughs> out of like the food packets and things and just put them in your fridge <laughs> yep so that's why yeah people are asking how does it last so long there's whole rooms that are like certain temperatures um and lots of uh lots of silica packets apparently yeah you have like a walk-in refrigerator and freezer fish another cutthroat eel fish So they're called cutthroat eels because their Zoom gills um, open on the underside of their head, and it looks like their their throat is cut. But that's just the way their gills open and how they breathe. They're also one of the main predators down here. So they are scavengers. They will. Rats come to, to food falls where, where they find them. I want to see his little throat. And sometimes when they see the lights of the ROV, they'll shake their heads and swim backwards. Can all fish swim backwards? Um, That's a good question. I don't, I don't think, so, think no. so. Actually, no, because... Sharks can't swim backwards. Some huh? sharks can't swim backwards. Oh, well. Can you swim backwards? <laughs> we had an issue with uh, some, I think they were, they were something small, but they were swimming into these like small areas, but they couldn't get themselves out just because they couldn't swim backwards. Like it would be perfectly fine if they could, but they just couldn't. Um. More ship life. A moon pool was in ch mentioned earlier in the gym. What is it used for? Um, squats. Swimming laps. <laughs> Deadlifts. <laughs> um, the moon pool is in the gym just because that's where it is. It's not. <laughs> what is a moon pool? A hole to the ocean. So our moon pool is used to deploy our USBL. Uh, so that's how we track the, the vehicles. So when we are getting ready to dive once we get on site and we're in on DP and not on main engines anymore. We we deploy the USBL, which means we lower a really long pole that's Zoom on in. a wire. And on the end of that pole is the USBL. We lower it below the hull of the ship at a meter or so. Um, and then it can track the vehicles. And then when we're done diving, we bring it back up before we go on main engines. It's beautiful. Now this is a, a new species of Chrysogorgia that for this dive, it, it has this sort of planar form. The other one we saw earlier had two um, planes, so like it, it was branching at the bottom. But this Come one wide, is please. different. That's really cool. It's really beautiful. Mm. Looks to be maybe 30 centimeters across. So it's about 12 inches. Navigator, Aaron, you have a fan in the chat who says you just live on the ship now, right? It's you probably Lindsay, I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yes, I, I, I don't know where my home is. I haven't seen it in a while. Somewhere on the East Coast. Uh, how far apart are the two green dots? Those are 10 centimeters apart. Have we ever stumbled upon large food or a whale fall? Oh, oh, they're asking if any of us have been here when we've stumbled upon large food or a whale fall. I certainly have not. 
I was, I was um, you, on were, the one. Were we on watch we were together? On, I think we were on yeah, watch together. Jess and Hannaford, yeah. With no, the no, I was with Rennie, I think, because we oh, first yeah, you guys came across found it. it. Yeah. yeah, you guys saw it in the mezzo, yeah. And then, and then we the came up and had all the fun. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Yeah. yeah, Jess flew it. It was really great. It's a great hour. There's a little fish to the right. Fish to the right. Where are you? Where is it? It looks like it went down. I didn't see a fish. Uh, maybe it was just really fast. There's definitely a fish. Oh, there right it is. There. I see it. I don't see it still. It's that wait, don't you don't go any higher. There it is. Roger, Down I see there. it. Oh, there we go. Don't question my fish. <laughs> I know you got this. <laughs> that. That's the fish amazing. are very blendy. <laughs> They're like the same color as the rocks. Well you can only spotted. see them when they move. Zoom in, please. Another cutthroat eel. Look at its head. So this cutthroat eel is in the subfamily Iliophony, which are the arrow-tooth eels. So this might be uh, Iliophis. They're a little bit skinnier than the snapper branchus. Uh, the pores along their lateral line tend to be white, and their um, their snouts are a little more pointy. Someone's Bye. wondering if the uh, no more he says not only the light might affect the eels, but if the vibration might bother them as well. Um, they definitely can feel it. Uh, I don't know how much it bothers them in the same way you know the air conditioning might not bother you, but you, but you feel it. Sometimes it makes me shake like that too. The air conditioning, but yeah, they definitely much, usually have that reaction to the ROV where they shake their head. Um, do we a lot them? of people have asked me if, if the lights will blind the fish and how much damage it could the lights can do. And, and we really don't have an answer for that question. But we believe that it's, it's sort of like if someone were to shine a flashlight in your eyes, it would be, would be hard to see for a few moments after that happens, but eventually uh, your eyes recover and you go back to normal and you go about your day. It's really annoying. Yep. You're just like, oh, why would you shine your light in my eyes? And, and that's sort of what I think about when the fish shake their heads. It's like, oh, my goodness, so bright. Uh, do our submersibles provide 3D video feed? I think the closest to 3D we get is the uh, the maps that are generated, right, Aaron? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess so. Have we done? We've done like post processing stereo camera stuff before, but nothing like real time. Is that true? There was real time stuff done here before I was around. Okay, I think it might have been on Argus. I don't really remember. It. I've seen the mounts for the on the framework for mounting two cameras in parallel yeah Someone yeah like apparently it was a massive seasickness maker like even the most <laughs> no, you know hardy stomach people would sit down there and try to pilot an rov while it's moving yeah. in three dimension different oh. than the ship was and someone lasted 10 minutes and that was the record or something like that it was just impossible oh, that's brutal you could do it later but not while you're trying to anyway yeah the post-process stuff though is super cool when so we, cool yeah and we've done i've seen other people do the the Stereo photo or just um, yeah reconstruction stuff. It's that's super cool, but nothing nothing real time right now. Probably won't be real time <laughs> because of the nausea. <laughs> Are there Yuck. any crew who live on the Nautilus year round? Ooh, don't. I think everyone cycles out at some point. Yeah, I mean we have full time staff, but they're not here all. The, they're not here full time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. The the yeah, main yeah. crew do some really long yeah, chunks, really long. but they yeah we've the season's been so long that we've now seen multiple cycles go through of the crew, which is feels kind of unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, 
question for me. He's talking about Falcor. That is me and the science communication fellow. Um, I was on board for their um, seeking space rock. So I think Nautilus did that mission twice and Falcor did it once. So we were looking for meteorites on the uh, seafloor off the Washington coast. And they've got a new ship now called Falcor 2. I did get the story about that name. It was, uh, I think, generated by Wendy and Eric Schmidt. So it's here to stay. So how do you find meteorites? Uh, very less scientifically than you would think. Um, so the, the way they knew where the meteorites might be is that um, this really large uh, meteorite came down and pass through uh, weather scanners so they could kind of track its pathway and usually they will break up before they get to um, get too far down into our atmosphere um, but this one was so large for so long that they figured that there might be chunks of it so they um, kind of mapped its trajectory and decided it should be in this patch of ocean so we'd send the ROV down and we had the first iteration what we called the cosmic dust pan. So it was like literally a dust pan with a sieve on the bottom and they'd sh scoop up some sediment and shake it, see if they could see any meteorites. We upgraded to what looked like, uh, it was like a cheese grater, but the hole was on the small end. So they'd scoop up sediment, shake it with the ROV arms, look inside, see if there are any chunks of meteorite. And then we also collected some uh, some sludge, some uh, just some mud from the seafloor to see if we could find some micrometeorites. Now, how do you identify a meteorite versus a regular rock? Is there something special about meteorites? Yeah, I can take that. Or you want to go geologist? You give it to a geologist and yeah. they tell you what it is, if it's a meteorite or not. That's not true. That's not the only way. But how do they know? <laughs> it's, it's melty. Yeah, there's like certain like metals and there's like certain things you can like look for in the minerals. Do you ever find things that can't be found on Earth in meteorites? No. No. I, I wondered the same thing, but it's all the same yeah. uh, same structure. Although I did watch this sci-fi movie with Rihanna. Oh my god! Anyone has seen, <laughs> <laughs> seen that movie? I forgot what it was called. That was but probably these, a good like, thing. Aliens came down and like <laughs> they're like, "Wow, it's crazy!" There's their suits and their ships are made of metals that we don't have on Earth, and I was just kind of like, "How is that possible?" That's that's the assumption that there's totally different stuff that. Really, everything is made out of the same stuff in different ways. Although we do discover new things all the time, so it's not impossible. Yeah. But yeah, you can you can find micrometeorites just by hanging out in your neighborhood. If you take a magnet, um, like a large magnet, and just kind of go like metal detecting with it, um, you need a microscope. But if you see anything that's magnetic and kind of melty, it's probably a micrometeorite. Are you saying melty? Melty, yeah. Um, so rock melts when it gets too hot. Oh, yeah. Um, so it, it's they're usually kind of spherical, fairly smooth. Yep. All right. Question about lateral lines on a fish. Okay. Uh, the eel looked like it had a line of dots or big pores on its side, are those its lateral line? Also, are fish's lateral lines more sensitive in the abyss where there is no sunlight? Um, so I'll start with the first part of the question. Uh, yeah, that was the, the eel's lateral line. So uh, the cutthroat eels uh, have a series of pores along the lateral line, and that, that helps with their sensory detection. And um, how sensitive they are, that's sort of hard to measure because, you know, you're trying to compare a reaction between different uh, species Human of animals. animals. It, it, it would be difficult to say whether or not they're more or less sensitive. But um, oh, these animals amen. living in dark areas are going to rely more on their other senses versus vision for uh, just know their general day-to-day -day lives so yes they're probably getting more sensory information from their lateral line than what they might 
from their eyes uh, in comparison to a uh, surface fish. So this is another one of those planar Chrysogorgia corals and has a number of different associates in its branches. I saw some opossum shrimp, those mycids. Um, what else are we seeing? There might be a couple amphipods hanging out. So it's a really nice coral. Exploration question. Do we ever hope to find old shipwrecks or other out of place finds? We hope to find whatever we find. I mean, this is, no one's ever seen this before. So we're just excited to be seeing what's out here. Nautilus has found many shipwrecks mm -hmm. over the years. Yep. I think I've only been on board for one. Some on purpose and some accidentally. That was on purpose, yeah. Yeah. Which one were you on board for, Trevor? I was on for the Coast Trader. It was a merchant vessel that was sunk by a torpedo. Yeah, where was it? Uh, off the coast of Washington, I believe. Oh, cool. Maybe off the coast of Canada? I think it was right on the border. Um, aren't some rocks just naturally magnetized and not meteors? Yes, so that's why we couldn't... Zoom oh. in, please. An Ely boy. Here's another cutthroat eel. So cutthroat eels are, are often found on seamounts, and some seamounts have no. really no. high Bye. densities of cutthroat eels. So we've been seeing quite a few in the last um, little bit of time as we've been transiting around on this seamount. So that suggests that there's quite a few eels around here. Um, so yes, some. The reason why uh, neither Fel or Sebastian nor Kurt could just strap some uh, some magnets to the arms and just like dig them around in the soil to find uh, to find um, meteorites is because yes, there's lots of things that are magnetic. Um, so you not only look for the magnetic properties but other qualities as well to determine if it's a meteorite or not. Yeah, so there's actually magnetic minerals in basalt. So a lot, uh, the main one like magnetite um, and it's actually pretty cool because the reason we're able to know that the earth's polarity has changed is from these minerals in the in the basalt because they align themselves with earth's magnetic field at the time that they crystallize and form and so then if you like look over millions of years at all of this oceanic crust you can see that the alignment has changed I think they changed on the time scale of like maybe like a hundred thousand years or something like that. Geologic babies. So what can we learn from meteorites? In that particular instance, um, they were looking for that mega meteorite because they wanted to, uh, you know, since they usually break up before they get to uh, Earth, I mean, you know, land on Earth, um, they wanted to know what it was made up of that kept it uh, solidly together for that long. Um, and it was more of a preventative thing. You know, if we know that there are these uh, more, I don't know if I want to call it stronger <laughs> meteorites out there, um, they might be able to do some preventative work in case uh, one uh, was came to do some damage. So it was not only finding, it was not as much that and more testing the hypothesis that with uh, the weather detection system, they can see those large meteorites and where they might fall. So it was kind of like testing his um, his trajectory map as well as finding out why it stayed together for so long. Okay, that's cool. Navigator, you got time for a mapping question? Sure, go ahead. Can you find sunken ships or planes or anything sunken uh, when you are mapping? You, yeah, you certainly can. Um, it really depends on the, the depth of the water and uh, where your sonar is. So we're in really, really deep water, um, 3,000 to 5,000 meters. And with our hull-mounted sonar, it just means that we 
are getting just a couple soundings every 100 meters or so along track. So resolution is really important. So spotting something small, like a relatively small, like a shipwreck or a plane, and, and that kind of resolution would be really, really tough. It's not impossible, but it'd be really difficult. If we had a um, something closer to the seafloor, like an AUV, much easier, because you'd get many more many more hits or many more soundings on that feature. Or if we were in shallower water, um, equally, it would be a lot easier. So um, yeah, totally possible. It's just what what's your depth of water? What sonar are you using? How close is that sonar to the seafloor? Um, and do you have any other instrumentation, like a, a side scan or something to help you uh, spot those kind of things? What percent of water depth can we get for resolution? We always say one to five percent. Um, yeah, really, you know, depends on sea state and all that. But sure, yeah, somewhere in there is a pretty good generalization. Cool. Side scan is so cool. Side scan is cool. Really, really nice for hunting for things. Geo question for you, Coralie. Um, we've previously talked about um, the valuable slash rare metals that can be found on the ferromanganese crust. Uh, what would we use that for? What would you use those materials for? Yeah, so there's a lot of things we can use them for. Um, as I said earlier, I don't know if anyone heard me, but I'm in a pottery class, and there's <laughs> manganese flakes in some of the clays that we use. Yep, I was ignoring you completely. <laughs> <laughs> but aren't so they also used for, like... <laughs> manganese for that. Cell um, phones and, like, lithium batteries yeah, and stuff. Yeah, so... <laughs> but seriously, though, we can <laughs> use these metals uh, for when we're trying to usher in this new era of green and renewable technology, we need a lot of these elements to do, help us do that, especially when it comes to battery storage. Right now, how we're storing batteries is mainly using lithium ion batteries. And to do that, we need cobalt, which is an element that's kind of depleted on land. Um, Right now, most of our cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and you know the working conditions there are really bad. You can imagine they're paid terrible wages, and miners, including including children who are mining, um, have no safety regulations. And if they get hurt or if they get killed, there's their family has no recourse. Um, and that's how you know Apple, Sony, you know. Toyota, that's how everyone gets uh, their cobalt, essentially. So, you know, obviously we don't want to do that anymore. Um, and then also it's just, it's not a renewable uh, resource on, on land. So we're looking for new reservoirs. It's one of those cute ones. Yep, we got oh, a cute is, fish this alert. This is a good fish. Best fish ever. Everybody's favorite fish. Chana Cops, Coloradus. Is there any better fish? I mean, look at that guy. I know, there really isn't any better fish. <laughs> just this is just the best fish. Just the cutest. <laughs> Someone when earlier. was this discovered? How long ago? Zoom in, please. Um, that is a good question for Bruce Mundy. He would probably know. Someone but earlier was asking for a baby. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, we've known about this fish for some time. Hey, buddy. You can really see the lure. Yeah, this one, you can really see it. Yeah. Can That's the lure. What's that? So this fish That's is in the same off. family with the angler fishes. So they hunt with their little lure. And yes, this fish can move that lure back and forth. It's like a little pom-pom. It's and so yes, cute. He is the cutest fish that ever was. It's quite, yeah, it's interesting looking, the lure spot. It's all the zoom I have. I wish I could touch it. I just kind of want to touch it. <laughs> Should I slurp them? 
<laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, you come back not looking very cute. <laughs> like, just look at this fish. This is a great fish. I think he's getting ready to All eat right, you. Steve Oscovich has mouthful. told us that this so. fish was first described in 1899. Wow. Oh, wow. wow. Thanks, Steve. Why is Steve awake? Um, that was my exact he's question. He's probably having breakfast. He's or waiting for awake. breakfast. Waiting. Oh, so not like 40 minutes. Steve, go to sleep. Yeah. All right. Moving along. I'll Thanks make fish. fish. Make you a bowl of Frosted Flakes later. He said he has an alarm go off when Chana Cops is seen. <laughs> a Chana Cops alarm. Well, you can't miss a Chana Cops. Every Chana Cops is a good experience. Oh, Megan, we've got a uh, fellow crochet enthusiast working on a crochet version. A crochet chanakov? Yep. Oh, that sounds great. Wait, Actually, what? <laughs> I should probably crochet a chanakov at some point. That right. would be the cutest crocheted thing ever. Yeah. I've got, got little eyes, too, that would work perfectly for it. Wait, is this the person who has the deep sea uh, crocheted Etsy shop? I still I don't can't know. find it. I've been looking. Yeah, so we need more information. We yeah. need all the information. I need a website. <laughs> you or if you have a website for your crochet sea life, please drop it in the chat. Also, Megan should start one. Also, Megan should start one. I should one. start my yeah. own deep sea crochet Etsy. Yeah. It's competing. I'll, I'll work <laughs> on it. I don't know how much time I have to dedicate to a full Etsy shop. Do you release your patterns for free? Um, I haven't even. I was about to say backup pattern, question. Yeah. <laughs> so I that usually just use other patterns. Did you do your own pattern? One. I did my own pattern for a onaga, but I didn't actually write it down. I kind of winged it the All whole right. time. I was looking at patterns for for other fish crochets, and then I just changed the fins around to to match the species I was going for. Just like I'm imagining opening a present and having that adorable little crocheted fish in it and how happy I would be. Yeah. Oh, and then if you made a real pom-pom for the lure, they have pom-pom makers. And that I haven't thought of a project that I needed pom-poms for, but that might be it. That might be it for sure. Yeah, a question about our little fish friend is it in relation to the frogfish. Yes, they are related to the frogfish. Uh, I guess some people might even call Chonicops a frogfish. There, there's a number of common names. Um, I think coffinfish is another common name they use for that, the Chonicops. Um, but yeah, frogfish and Chonicops are related. And Chonicops might be considered a frogfish. Gotcha that link, Aaron. Yep, I got it. Oh, that's right, because you can see everything I do. <laughs> creepy. Oops, ooh. Oopsies. Just wanted to have you guys see that sand really bright. Yeah. Can you enhance the sand, please? Enhance. <laughs> um, how do these deep sea fish find their mates in the pitch black sea? I think there's a bunch of answers to that one. Yeah. There are a lot of answers to finding mates. Uh, a lot of it, I believe, is chemical signaling, but uh, you could have bioluminescent signaling. Um, you could just wander aimlessly and hope you find uh, a mate, or you can uh, not wander at all and just sort of spawn and, and let your gametes fly free and hope they come together at some point. Yeah, there there's a lot of different... Uh, strategies to reproduction because this is a very challenging environment to reproduce in you have to find new and great solutions for this age-old problem how to reproduce got another mapping question shoot do we have a forward scanning multi beam on the ROV itself? Yep. 
Yeah. No. Sorry, cool. downward and upward scanning. We have currently we have no multi beam on the ROV. We, we have, have what do you call them? Had one on before. This is a scanning sonar. Just a scanning sonar. Yeah, single. Okay. Whatever you call it, yeah, single beam. Um, we like, do have a multi beam that goes on Hercules, but it's where is it right now? In the shop, maybe like in our shop. It's still on board, isn't it? We do. We have an orbit sonar that can be mounted on Hercules. That is a multi beam, but we mm. we kind of use it. We use it like a scanning sonar often <laughs> to look for bubbles. Um, we did use it for some high resolution mapping, but yeah, sorry, Meso is just a scanning sonar, and that's the one. When we talk about looking at the sonar, that's what we're typically talking about. Um, the the Meso display to look for look for things that we might run into. A lot of crochet fans in the chat <laughs> because they need to form a group. Megan can lead it. Um, does sound play any role in the deep sea as it does in shallow water reefs? Is that a fish? No, that's sand. <laughs> <laughs> not a fish. You're getting uh. a little desperate there. <laughs> it's not desperate. <laughs> I just don't want to miss anything. <laughs> Yeah, don't want to miss a fish. Nope. I'm team fish over here. I agree. Team fish is a good team to be on. Yeah, you can't get known as the fish missers. Nope. Bunch of fish missers. It's definitely got fishier in the last few mi minutes, so maybe we'll see some really cool fish. Don't get my hopes up. Don't toy with my emotions like that. <laughs> say that's that's just going to be a heartbreak. Question: Do we have IT people on board? Oh yes, we do. Oh, the wonderful yes. Tim. For everything from fix this very very important mission specific issue to my file is downloading really slow. Can I hook to the Ethernet? <laughs> Which was me yesterday. <laughs> So, yes, we do have IT people. And it wasn't just a slow file. It was not downloading. So it was a crisis. Um, the sound question, I'm not sure what sound they're referring to. It says, does sound play any role in the deep as it does in shallow water reefs? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what that question is about. Yeah. Um. Graham, if you could send us a follow-up, we might be able to answer that for you. Do specimens change chemically as the uh, as you, we bring them up from the seafloor? Like they're affected by pressure, but is there any kind of chemical change? You know, actually, we wouldn't know what their chemical makeup is like. Exactly, <laughs> on the sea we wouldn't know um, <laughs> right. unless we were able to to do an analysis at the seafloor and then uh, again when we brought it to the surface. But we believe that there is no, there shouldn't be any real chemical change from the seafloor to the surface. But yeah, I mean, it's possible. Some chemicals do react with temperature change and we do try to keep the temperature consistent as best we can with our bio boxes, but there's only so much we can do to try to keep our samples cold. Um, that's a good question. Oh, I get to break out my art background on this one. It is a question from the UK. At what distance do the ROV lasers, uh, from what at what distance from the ROV do the lasers meet? They never meet. Um, they are perfectly parallel at 10 centimeters apart. The reason why it looks like they are getting closer together is because of uh, perspective. It's called one point perspective. So if you look at like the classic example of like railroad tracks, how they seem to get closer together the farther into the distance they go they never meet it just visually looks like they're getting closer 
So they will go on parallel forever. Force, it's not force perspective, it's just one point perspective. Force perspective is when you, well, force it. <laughs> you you uh, make it uh, a little more extreme than it would be in, in reality. There are lots of snail trails around here. See all those little squiggly lines across the rocks? We did make uh, some collections on our previous dives of some of the uh, critters that make those trails. So they're the real Roombas of the deep. Mm -hmm. They're definitely cleaning off the rocks, uh, but missing large Bots. Give it time. Give it a couple <laughs> thousand years, they'll get there. Yeah, by the time they're done, it's already full of sediment again. <laughs> Oh, we got a follow up on the sound question. They were referring to sounds made by shrimp and fish in shallow, shallow water. Um, clownfish, are, for example, are known to make grunting sounds. They were thinking that it might help in finding mates, etc. I see. Okay. Um, well, we don't know because we're not listening to what the sounds are down here. Um, some animals likely make sounds, but I'm not sure how critical it is. It's definitely something that hasn't been studied. Um, most of the things that we've listened to in the deep sea are, are, are larger animals, but at this depth, I don't think anybody's really uh, considered the sounds that maybe what's that eels tiny, make. What's that tiny pink thing right there? With uh, the, on the side of the rock? Right side, left side? I don't oh, I see it. Right side. Right it Telemarker. might be a sea star. Go ahead, zoom. Yep, it's a tiny sea star. This is a hymenaster, also known as the slime star. And you can see uh, its like internal body. It sort of has this sort of jacket that it's wearing um, that covers the top of the sea star. And then inside you can see that it's very star shaped. Mm -hmm. For some of the larger ones, uh, that, that outside covering is more opaque, so you can't see the the body of the star in, inside yeah. as well. Yeah, That's kind of cool. Wrinkly. There's a a white thing on the rock. If we're fast, I'm looking at this. This thing. might be one of those uh, trail makers. Trailblazers. Trail mix. Mm -hmm. Zoom in, please. This is a slit snail. It's one of those ones making that little trail. You can see the trail kind of squiggling. Just started. And so that's okay, trail. That trail is made from it eating the sediment off the rock rather than leaving a slime deposit, correct? Correct. Yeah, it's making the rocks clean. Geologists like clean rocks, right? We love clean rocks.
And there's a couple people doing some research for us. Yes, we did find the uh, the Etsy shop with the crochet creatures. We got the link, so we're all good to go. What is it? It's Abfab de Art. De Art is a D E A R T E. Abfab de Art. Fab de Art. F A B F A V. F A B A B F A B. D E A R T E. Ab the... Ab Fab de Art. Yeah. Okay. That's the the shop creator. You're welcome at Fab de Art. <laughs> I'm looking her up, looking the shop up. Sponge. A sponge. We have another Caliphacus sponge. Seeing a lot of Caliphacus. Been wanting to make a Calorealist joke for days now. Just, <laughs> it's never felt appropriate. Wait, I can't find the shop. Uh, a A oh my goodness. A B F A B D E A R T. A R T E. Oh. Oh. But we have the link for you later. Yes, Abfab is a British TV show. It is, and it's amazing. I love it. Got some love for Argus in the chat. Got a second screen dedicated to uh, just for Channel Two. We love Argus too. All right, looks like we have a Norella Coral and then the Actinostolid Anemone and maybe a Brasingian Sea Star in view right now. So here's our Norella. Here's our Actinostolid. And then there's our Brasingian. Looks like a long way down. There we go.
bio question for you, Megan. Have we found associates in, an, in anemones at this depth? Associates on anemones? Said Anne. I was just trying to survive the tongue twister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes we see uh, associates on anemones, uh, like um, scale worms. We've seen them on those big actinostolid anemones. Uh, there might be other associates that are much smaller, like uh, maybe Nemertians on anemones. Uh, but a lot of these animals could be hard to see unless we get a really good zoom. Then anemones are often associates on uh, corals. Sometimes we see specific anemones hanging out in the branches of corals. Uh, you might see anemones um, all over the rocks, but also um, perhaps on some sponge stalks. A good looking rock. Oh, and it's got a good looking coral. So this is another one of those Chrysogorgi corals that we collected earlier. Bonk. Very wispy. And there's a sea cucumber up here. So that sea cucumber is likely in the family Synalactidae. It's a really interesting uh, feature. Just looks like tubes of toothpaste. Getting all squeezed out on top of each other. And that way that uh, lava flows, pillow flows are formed on these seamounts. For those in the chat looking for uh, details on the capabilities of the ROVs, you just head to our website. It's nautiluslive.org. And you scroll down just a little bit to the right, it says live data, and you see a picture of Hercules and Argus. You just click on that and it tells you all of their specifications. Um, Hercules can go down to approximately 4,000 meters. Uh, I've, I've made a mistake, now they're putting tongue twisters in the chat. <laughs> Ooh, there's a big rock. Hello, big rock. Hey, what depth are we sampling rocks and niskins? We won't get there that in time. Yeah, 30, 39. 3039? Yeah. We won't get there. Unless we find a nice uh, vertical wall to ascend. Here's one now. <laughs> Oh, it's not that big. Cool shaped rocks, though. We're rocking and rolling. Yeah, it kind of looks like a face. <laughs> okay. A face only a mother could love. <laughs> <laughs> They're like the stone trolls. Or abstract art, you know, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> Everything is art. I don't think rocks float anyone's boat. No, they're, they're pretty heavy. What if they were very small rocks? Or what if they were the, the floaty rock? What's that yeah. floaty rock called? Pumice? Pumice. Pumice. Yeah, so some rocks can float your boat. If 
you put enough air in your rocks, they float. I was just about to say, you can totally sink a pumice, but we'll not. There's a squatty. We'll not get pessimistic about that. Zoom in the squatty, please. Another Munidopsis. Little squat lobster. There's a lies. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. We have Windows Update. Thank you. <laughs> I need the newest virus protection on my sonar computer. No. What? Stop that. Are you kidding me? Yeah, we definitely don't want to update our computers at sea. Especially while we're streaming and, and trying to do things. Sounds like you've gone through a personal hardship with that story. I, I certainly have. I went on a cruise and uh, my computer decided it needed a Windows update uh, on day one, right after we got out of uh, our cell phone uh, data range. <laughs> and it couldn't complete its download. It started doing stuff, locked up my computer because it couldn't finish the update and I, I couldn't use the computer for the rest of the cruise. It was really unfortunate. Yeah, perfect. Bye. But fortunately, I had another computer to use, so I was not computerless. It just uh, couldn't use my personal computer. Do you want the cucumber, please? Cucumber. Oh, yes. This looks like an Onira Fanta. One of those spiky cucumbers. I just love these little little protrusions they have all over their body. All right, come wide, please. To read a question for you, Megan. Uh, for those who study invertebrates in particular, how do you start studying echinoderms and other inverts? I'm currently going to college for entomology, but also interested in other marine invertebrates. Well, uh, a good way to start is to take a invertebrate class. So um, I took invertebrate biology in college, and so I got to learn a lot about all the different types of invertebrates and their taxonomy. Um, sort of showed me, you know, which organisms I found interesting and which ones uh, I I maybe didn't find as interesting. Uh, but really, what got me really into studying invertebrates was just seeing the range of animals that are out there and learning about the taxonomy as I was working uh, with these animals. So I worked at an environmental consultation company doing um, marine invertebrate taxonomy and freshwater taxonomy. So I learned a little bit of entomology and... I was like, mm, I really like bugs, but I'm way more interested in marine invertebrates. So I started focusing on that. And then uh, corals sort of came into the picture when I was looking for graduate school programs. And I didn't really know a lot about deep sea corals at the time when I was applying. But as I learned more and more, I just found out how fascinating these communities are. And so it's all about, you know, doing your own research and, and finding something you find really interesting and, uh, and going forward with that. So definitely don't just pick one thing and stick with it. But like, say you're really interested in econoderms, uh, which is a really fascinating group because there are just so many different body forms in the econodermata from sea stars to sea cucumbers, urchins, uh, feather stars. Uh, 
and even within those large groups there are some really really wild animals wow look at that sponge you can zoom if you want and uh like sponges in particular uh, i didn't even know i had an appreciation for sponges until uh chris kelly started telling me all about them or and something about little guy. they are just so fascinating. Uh, That's a really weird sponge. Was there something in there? Yeah, there was something inside the sponge. It's probably a polychaete. It's like two little dots. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is actually good advice from the chat. Um, an invert person could uh, volunteer to National History Museum's invert collections. Volunteering yeah. at museums is always a good idea. That is a good idea. And it's definitely a way to see a whole bunch of different organisms uh, and learn about taxonomy because a, a lot of taxonomists might be associated with museums. They're um, going to museums uh, to look at the source materials and that's exactly where our specimens will end up is in a museum where they can be uh, viewed and used by scientists. So. You don't have to be a museum curator to use museum um, facilities and and and, uh, and collections. Um, we have a great question that is very timely. Uh, the ship is rolling really hard right now, and they're asking any seasick remedies that we found work well. Everybody tells you ginger. Ginger does not do anything for me. Um, I just get a lot of sleep and stay hydrated, but I just get sleepy. I don't get nauseated. Yeah. Um, I also wear C-bands. I don't know if they work or not, but like I don't get nauseated, so. Uh. Um, I've worked a lot on boats with different people, and each person reacts differently. It seems to different seasickness medicines. So like, even if one doesn't work for you, another might. Yeah. It doesn't work for a different person. Um, and for some people, it just doesn't work at all. Unfortunately, yep, we have a poor uh, intern aboard right now that is still seasick, and we're in like a week and a half in. So, and you know, if the seas get rougher, that also affects things as well. Uh, we're about to do a watch switch, uh, but I will answer one last question. This dive will last approximately 24 hours, and it started at midnight, so we've got a, another solid almost day for the, in this dive left. Less than 10 meters to go to your rock sample. Gonna make it? Yeah.